Hello everyone, today we talk about Dante Alighieri, or better as was really called Durante the Altichiero degli Altichieri. And I start this series that will last for five videos, this included, for celebrating the 700 years from the death of the single most important author in medieval history easily um, and without any historiographical literary or any other possible criterion of evaluation a series that we will upload every once in a while probably in the along the remaining months of 2021 um, and that I want to be uh, an occasion for uh, reflecting not just on the author in his work but properly on our understanding and the uh, usefulness that Dante has for 21st century um, uh, world uh, altogether at this point. And simply starting, as I often do, uh, talking about these things from, like, can we be Europeans or Westerners without even having read the comedy? The title would be Commedia, uh, in, in 14. Uh, century Florentine, uh, even though of the Italianization comedy and so on, but that would be the, the, the masterpiece, as you know, uh, that would inform all Italian and eventually from there all European literature for the centuries to come. And that represents uh, an unicum in, in properly in, in world history, meaning that, of course, there are uh, other important works, but here we are literally at the highest levels of any age for, for that matter but um, this one being a product properly of medieval civilization stands out for uh, lots of things that we address on Schwerpunkt that is mostly based on medieval history as as you know I am a medievalist um, and that however have a universal meaning right and it's sometimes difficult to to approach the topic or even sometimes making people realize why such parameters that we have sketched out here already are the case, right? There, there has been, uh, I'm sorry to, to be polemical on a video like this, but I, I think that Dante would have understood because as we all see, you know, he lived in a in an age of bitter factionalism and war and, you know, he also directly participating, but recently i don't even want to know know more about the details but there is a journalist I, I don't know from from which country i don't want to even remember that fundamentally you know for his readers i don't know even if it was a blogger or whatever wrote ah you know dante shakespeare was better right because it was more modern and dante is just mono you know kind of dichotomic in moral terms it's either uh, right or wrong, good or bad, whatever. It's you see, I I, I believe the boundaries of human stupidity are really uh, endless, uh, right? It's it's as if you know you had told the people who invented uh, locomotives that you know, but you know, airplanes were better because they could fly, right? Now understand if journalists, uh, as always, made their own job instead of trying to to boast any kind of further mm, competence like any other profession, it would be better, right? And I understand, maybe this, this journalist was clever, right? Exploiting 700 years uh, that of of uh, the greatest uh, medieval author to essentially cash uh, out to, say, to milk the, the ignorance of its own audience. Because that's a problem we were saying before, right? If If you... If you have an audience like today, the average person in the world, and even the average person in the West, that is surely the most educated in the world, but still grossly ignorant and underschooled, you know, you, you present a concept like, you know, Shakespeare is more modern, it's better than that. Well, are you sure of that? Like, you know, what kind of uh, comparison without any context can that be? And people are that ignorant to to believe, and, and especially in this case, there is obviously the, the hypocritical flattery of you know the uh, radically morally inferior uh, average uh, modern person who believes that he is better than people who lived in the past so if you tell them yeah you know we are better now you can't look at people down in the past with contempt because you know uh, you we are better wink wink no 
Uh, it turns out you're not. Not just because, as we will explain, um, a figure like Dante, but generally speaking, people uh, in his age lived in a world that he would fundamentally be destroyed by, simply, not, not physically speaking, but properly because of lack of intelligence. And, or I could bring out other dynamics that is properly to, to realize why this is the case. It's not that we have lost altogether intelligent people by the 21st century, it's just that uh, today, uh, on average, um, uh, people with no particular talent or education or capacity or, or anything have, say, more wealth and more means to, to say their own opinion. This is, this is positive from one side, but this is also the result. It is much easier to, you know, fish uh, in the pool and, you know, uh, hit more people with just more stupid ideas than, than before, right? Uh, um, you, you would have, like, the average Westerner today hasn't even any clue of how to properly memorize, learn, study, apply the things Dante would, what was able to, like many um, intellectuals of his times, by the way. Um, and there is, a, a, I don't know if you have an idea of the scale of historiographical production about Dante Alighieri, like in, in all Western world, like trying to quantify properly how much has been written on Dante since his own times to this day. Uh, nobody can live enough to read anything, but not even, not even 10 lives or 100 lives, bro. Um, the point seriously being that we're in front of something that should make any soul tremble in any, uh, in, for, from any point of view, from the sheer intelligence, sensitivity, vision, uh, artistic uh, quality, uh, balance, harmony, um, capacity of ranging every uh, fundamentally in every field of knowledge of his times. Dante is a great compendium, properly of medieval knowledge uh, in itself. Um, today, as we'll see, I, today I want to talk about his life mostly because uh, I also. Uh, discovered, talking with people, so, you know, older than me, educated in the West, and whatever, that uh, people, generally speaking, think of Dante as, of course, historiography generally has made of him, like, that, that he's a poet, right? Um, especially Italians in there with their classicistic mindset, in, especially in literary matters, have legitimately uh, crowned him uh, for what he deserved to be the greatest poet of his times, there is no doubt about this, but uh, it's as if this had been received in a broader cultural dimension worldwide, as if Dante was just a poet, right? If I told you that this was um, an elite knight who charged uh, in, in the first line of battle of, of Italian communal armies and almost uh, got killed in the process, and or that he sentenced people um, to had their tongues cut off, or that he uh, communicated with emperors, and or that uh, he was actually a moneylender by, 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 you know, by family, that um, he was a, a diplomat, or he was an ambassador, that he was uh, part of his um, city-state government, that uh, he had, uh, of course, a family, but also many lovers, uh, that he was a friend with some of, our, of the other great intellectuals of his times, that he toured uh, the whole Italy in a situation of permanent war, and to which he also partook uh, actively, uh, as we were saying before, um, and lots of other things that I will try partly to explain in the context. Well, I think that the, the sympathy, even just instinctively, towards this figure would be much greater than just the, the monument, the eloquium that has been made about him, um, historiographically would, would give back. And I would say, you know, if you buy any book on, on the author, there is enough historical background to explain uh, certain aspects of his life that definitely made his, his own work, right? And I'm not um, an expert, uh, a literature expert, right? I wish I could. Uh, I, if I wanted, actually, I could produce hundreds of videos to go in, in detail, like properly the hardcore one, and properly also the literary matters that are terribly fascinating. As you know, on Schwerpunkt, I don't make um, 
literature videos to cook, meaning that we can't talk about literature, of course, medieval literature, and pleasantly so, but making a companion, but never focused on a specific source, a specific author, etc. We could do that. I don't know how interested you, you are. I, I think, you know, I'm mostly uh, a polymologist, so I, I, don't, I don't deal with this stuff. But in fact, today I hope to present Dante's life in, in the light that I have seen properly even the historical era, because I had the opportunity to study also for years this specific phase um, in which Dante is leaving. I specialize exactly in this, um, this the, the end of the 13th, the, the early, uh, yeah, the first half of the 14th century. He, he, well, he lived between 1265 and 1321, in fact. And, um, and there is indeed so much to say just about this aspect. I could respond to that journalist, uh, since you know we are making it uh, a matter of uh, also, you know, to, to banally, you know, minimize the the, the, the gaff of the individual that in sequestra un uomo of by Primo Levi. Uh, so if this is a man, by the, this author that tells his tragic experience. Of Jew in the Lager of Auschwitz, mm -hmm. so in, in somewhere that would have gone pretty close in, in human history uh, to Dante's Inferno, right? So among the daily horrors and violence, uh, he found a moment of relief, right? Living in a situation where you you know you can die from a moment to another, and you see death all around, and you surely have already accounted all this, and you sh you have to live with that p for pure survival. Well, Levy tells um, the anecdote of a, of a quick, uh, a rapid uh, speech with a French companion um, for, for whom he translated during a brief post of forced labor in the camp the 26th Canto of the Inferno that is dedicated to the last journey of Ulysses. I, I don't know if you have ever read that passage, we can do it at some point. It's one of the single most beautiful pieces in the history of uh, mankind. Uh, uh, I, it's hard to tell, it's, it's the story of U Ulysses deciding essentially to cross the Gibraltar Strait and to go uh, towards the unknown, towards the forbidden of what the world had was established as, uh, had established as a boundary, right, and therefore going further, for the pure will of 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 intellect and thirst of knowledge, and just a medieval man could understand so much this this push, this drive, right, um, and uh, Ulysses eventually arrives almost basically in the face of earthly uh, heaven, and he's swallowed with his uh, ship by by a, a whirlwind and he's taken under the ocean and and he goes to hell for this because he had dared to to go beyond what the the right boundary the here it's not a, a fixed arbitrary boundary it's what fundamentally God established um, in a in a physics it's a border between physics and metaphysics Right, so it, it it is something that goes beyond any other properly uh, physical norm. It, it's something that goes beyond what properly the act, it goes to to the root of what it means to accept the fact that humanity is limited in itself. It's a deeply scientific realization. Is the is the necessity for which we always have to tend towards the truth, but we cannot know the truth, and therefore, in order to understand the real world, we have to have faith. Right, and this is a deep, it was, it's actually, you can say a banal concept as you understand, but it's basically the easiest uh, legitimization you can also give to, to religion, faith, and what properly it's meant for, and what our sciences are actually rediscovering, properly studying religion and matching clamorously with basically all what we know about nature and the world, etc. And that, of course, was limpidly clear to uh, a 13th, 14th century author like Dante. And while Levy extracts with uh, difficulty, you can imagine what your your head, your mind is blown by such a, an experience. 
when you of a persecuted of of a you know somebody that is brought under that under pressured uh, vexed tortured and properly being pressured because you are discriminated there properly for the way you are because you're denied the right of equality of, of, of life even at that point so that you are brought to the limits of human understanding well Dante Levy says for a while uh, gave him this uh, almost he, he, he perceived this quote something enormous something enormous in those lines perhaps because it was the reason of our destiny and of our being here today right so this dialogue between the two men dealing with the most dramatic problems of survival can give an idea render an, uh, an idea of the extraordinary depth of cultural and human meanings acquired in the course of centuries by Dante's work and this is fascinating because as, as we were saying before Dante has been uh, portrayed has been received has been a, he's a mysterious figure as we, uh, we will see now because we, we don't know too much about his life of course you know we're lucky enough to have an idea a concrete idea of course but um, nobody could interview we don't have a, a uh, an autograph for example I know I have worked with some paleographers that have as they their greatest dream to find Dante's out um, you know handwriting which is which is pos still possible to be found in a sense and uh, considering also the, the, ma the man participation very important um, activities let aside his properly literary uh, activity. Um, so we will make a synthesis of this, but it's important to stress in this regard how much um, Dante is fixed as a sort of, of, of myth in itself, right? Uh, it, it, he, the, it, this myth was born in the same moment it, when it was, still, uh, was, was still alive, right? And where people understood, especially within the Florentine entourage and eventually expanding, but properly the magnitude of these mind that had produced, as we will see in the series, something clamorous in, in the history uh, of mankind. That it is, uh, is still a mystery in a sense, right? In its greatness and in its uh, depth. And, and also for the effect that made on us. Because, you see, this is the point. Dante is um, a, com a man completely, totally immersed within his ideas values, prejudices that, that are typical of the Middle Ages, right? He, in, in the comedy, he depicts, for example, a, a picture of afterlife that today, concretely, nobody can can believe in anymore, right? He propagates political ideas that already, in his own times, were surpassed. Dante was anachronistic, in a sense, for his own times, and not, it would surprise you how this was, even in literature, for his own time. Um, and not just in international politics, etc. He had a vision of morals, of religion, of love that is surely very distant from, from ours, right? So uh, reading his work means to explore um, a fascinating paradox that is typical of literary experience. That is, how is it possible that a man of the past that imbued with uh, a a very different culture from our own can tell us things that are still very actual, very alive, uh, very concrete, and to become this way uh, a contemporary and even our friend, in a sense. Uh, reading Dante is, um, as I was saying before, I don't know how many of you have read him. I, I think that if you want to do yourself a favor, in your life you can read the comedy to at least it to at least even know what it's actually written in there because we don't have just to tell you know we get the condensated story often but do, do you know what actually is written in there right what are the single episodes aside from the the, the, the bigger scheme etc but what does it concretely refer to in the work because that's the work right in, in theory Dante should be read in in the original language 
right? So that he's 14th century Florentine, that he's essentially what uh, uh, modern Italians stand from, right? Because he's exactly the one that created that, right? Uh, Dante created Italian uh, in the sense that he fulfill he completed the range of which the Italian vernacular could reach from things such as the lowest topics, such as the ones to be found in, in the Inferno, as to theology in the highest at uh, the highest level of medieval science um, in in the paradise, right? So he gave the language a spectrum that ever since was imitated in a way that became the standard. Dante is uh, uh, an incredibly prolific mindset. He properly uh, emerged simply from nothing. There is a parallel here that is the same Florence, that is the same boom that that city had made in the last 50 years and had brought it on before of international policy um, uh, in a way that produced not just a great uh, great poetry, great great works of science, etc. in the same case of Dante, but also great historiography. When you read his contemporaries, such as Villani or Compagni, that those are stories that were basically the single most famous work, read work after the Bible at the time, and that um, informed, in fact, also all European literature. If you if you read, uh, I don't know, uh, these were all Florentines, by the way, and that that's not a Fl Florence was the richest city in the world, literally, at the time. Right, and and uh, this moment of booming of the great um, high medieval civilization that after the mid 14th century crisis, not even the Renaissance would have reachieved, like f the 15th century Florence of the Medici, for example, was a completely different thing. Right, those were the richest men in the world that had ever existed in relative terms, but the city in itself was not what had been before. Um, and I don't know if you read even. Uh, in, in comparison, the single most advanced historiographies in Europe at the time, like if you read a Flemish chronicle, uh, a chronicle of the 14th century, it seems like to be uh, 100 years backwards compared to to, to Florentine uh, historiography. It's something mind blowing because these it's as if these people, if you read the, the literature of their time, it's as if it had began out of the blue completely because there was nothing like this before to write. Essentially, the single most important source is medieval history. Um, by um, rational approach, by criticism, by properly level of information, etc., that from a day to another, right? Literally, from a generation to another. And um, these things are maybe not so palpable if you're not so much into medieval literature or if you have, don't have a practice with these sources but once you get there you see you're literally mind blown by it because you understand properly the boom there and uh, Dante is yet however as medieval author to core unsurpassed and unsurpassable of course, I mean th there is no chance it can be uh, equivocated in, in, in this regard so today we talk about his life and I care about giving the right background and context because Dante's life was was amazing uh, in itself tragically so but uh, without that probably uh, we all the critics pretty much agree would have not had his work so um, about his life, we have also very few safe news. That that is, uh, he was born in Florence uh, in between May and June, 1265. Right? He he was because we know because he says at some point that he was Germany. Right? So more or less, uh, it was those uh, those months um, from the petty nobility. Right, uh, the Italian city states, as you know, had, we've talked enough about this, had a, a democratic criterion for the election to the militia, the knighthood. Right, so they were noble because they were rich enough. They they hold they held houses, lands. Right, so they the, the family, the Alighieri, had a moderate wealth, uh, welfare altogether, and. Um, they were important, but seemingly uh, they they were of Germanic origin, as uh, the, their name suggests. Uh, they uh, had uh, the, the, there is, however, a, a, a few information properly about the genealogical reality of the family, because 
in those times there wasn't such a thing like people remembering the the story of their families before the kind of a of a individuals remember right about his own life um like they they consulted very old people to know about even their relatives and things like that and and only from this time onwards things began to change uh, in a way uh, he had uh, from uh, he was born from from Alighiero of the Alighieri it was Alighiero of Bellicione that in turn would have been Alighiero uh, of Cacciaguida and Cacciaguida would have been this ancestor coming probably from northern Italy and joining uh, Conrad the third of Hohenstaufen during the second crusade and there is all that it seems at like a, a fiction in a sense but at least this is what Dante says about his own family and uh, so yes the were technically families of knights right they practiced uh, the craft of arms they knew how to fight on horseback they were, they were knights to core um, when um, Dante was 12 so as I was saying before uh, the, the name altogether would be Durante of the Alighieri, right? But he was contracted in Dante, more, but that's important. Um, when he was 12, uh, his father uh, bound him by contract, as it was used at the time, to marry Gemma of the powerful family of the Donati. The Donati were black Guelphs one of the single most prominent families in Florence. These were literally very powerful clansmen. They, um, uh, the Gemma was a uh, cousin to Corso Donati, that is uh, a very important figure in Florentine history at the time. He was known as the Baron. Right? These figures were still loaded with kind of that medieval nobiliar ethos, even properly the appearance, the hair color, the, the, the eyes, was, was meant to be to, to symbolize it, force, provis, the spirit, that knighthood properly, that nobility, that elevation above the others, right? It was still very strong, even a kind of allegedly more democratic reality like Italian uh, communes, but it was, they were fundamentally feudal lords and seen like that and appreciated like that because of ethos, right? Because of this kind of still barbarian background, this... this this ideal of uh, of, of chieftains, of leaders, of war, etc. And uh, Corso would um, even try at some point a coup in Florence and get killed in the process uh, during the escape. But he was a very clever figure that even probably was connected to Dante at some point because of when he fled, as we will see in the Aretine uh, countryside, to fight against the same Florence. And kind of mediating, and it was, it was a, an incredibly permeable political reality, properly in the city. And a marriage with um, with Corso's cousin was, you know, a very good mark also of the Alighieri status. That, albeit not overwhelmingly rich or powerful, but were still capable of having such a tie. So, eventually, Dante would get married with Gemma. Donat, and from the marriage will be born three or four children. They, uh, Dante's children are important for a number of reasons because not much during his father's life, well, you know, the, because he was exiled, as you know, that they lived separated for a long time, but rather also for the, um, also his son-in-law at some point, um, uh, saved like tra treasured and had to bring back to Florence from the exile so all his father's work and uh, about those traditions about those manuscripts etc that that's where all the uh, philology history literature etc inqu inquires still because we would like to get to know more if possible in all the enormous documentary production that uh, exists uh, in Italy in those years and that is still to be thoroughly studied because it's literally immense right this was the single most literate and productive area uh, in Europe properly at at the middle lab, middle kind of at commoners level in a sense so it's incredibly uh, rich and we, we still still uh, there's still a lot to get from it um, so uh, his father was Dante's father was essentially a, a moneylander Right, usually was namely prohibited in medi medi medieval Christendom, but still practiced at these Florentine families were 
ever more increasingly specializing in banking. They had funded uh, at that point the uh, the the Angevin Crusade in, 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 in the Kingdom of Sicily, from which they had been uh, by, for which they had been subcontracted the grain imports to um, to the rest of you. So they were make they had been making a lot of money fast and that's part of, of that sudden boom that we were looking at before explaining Flo the Florentine primate in this point and they wouldn't live normally like this so the lots of, of wealth they, they would invest they would land etc make the living so um, at, at his father's death in 1283 Dante had to administer his family asset and he didn't need to work in order to leave he would live as a knight Right. And as such, he participated to the Florentine army in the many, but I stress really many, go look at the Florentine military activity at the time. It's embarrassing. It's uh, sometimes at this point, it's larger even than the, the one of, waged by the great uh, Ghibelline signaries of the north, in spite of the fact that Florence was ruled at this point by, at this point by the, so the so called popolo, the people. Right, was a popular government. That didn't mean literally the commoners like shoemakers or things were ruled, but essentially the arts, the the priori, as they were called, the communal government that as they had entered and monopolized the the, the arts and crafts that were extremely rich and that would uh, had taken over by often sanctioning the so-called uh, the the great ones, the magnates as they called it, were all essentially those people were rich enough to be seen as a threat to the uh, say the, the republican status and therefore watched out and often also exiled their goods confiscated and so on um, it was a very factional reality but Florence also waged war against the um, the, the surrounding Tuscan cities at this point there was no hegemonic status Florence would rise at that level at some point but gradually Florence would often get defeated in some of the major battles at the time but gradually had so many demographic and economic resources that would always revive and take over the enemy city-states but at this point the situation is still very fluid there are many other cities um, Arezzo, Siena, Pisa, look all these um, Pistoia, all these centers that all were interfering with each other Dante fought at one of the most important European battles of that era that has been a bit rendered famous because of his own participation, but is objectively important for many reasons, uh, mostly political, but were also tens of thousands of fires on the field. That is Campaldino, right? Comparatively, other Italian battles of the time were sometimes even larger, more important, and have been obscured because, you know, Italian historiography didn't study them much. Uh, as a consequence, also foreign authors didn't, didn't properly understood their importance, but there are literally the largest battles fought in Europe at this time are most of them are actually most of literally are Italian there is no doubt about this just check the data so I will be, I make a video at some point about this um, and they had a by the way a very advanced uh, I made a video about this I think already but uh, probably have to say more Mm, it wasn't specifically about tactics, but if you even if you look at the organization of these armies, normally a city like Florence, a city like Florence, which means a city alone could move tens of thousands of, of men, right? That this is normally what what a kingdom would do, uh, and, and that size. And literally, yes, uh, after the Kingdom of France, the single largest powers in Europe at this time were Italian ones. Look at the the La Scala dynasty that also Dante took refuge there. That were Singly, yes, the, the second large just military in Europe. Have you ever heard about that? Probably not, because you know nobody cares about history, and the, the, I mean the real one, not the TV series or other bullshit. Like, but unfortunately, that's why studying Dante is also important. In Campaldino, Campaldino is a very beautiful battle. Also, tactically speaking, uh, there's a lot there going on, and uh, Dante was actually participating to the most prestigious, the place of honor, the so-called feditori, which in Italian stands like those that fundamentally have to break through. This was elite cavalry, appointed, the sources say, especially in that sense, it was typical of these um, times, um, uh, like they would join freely as volunteers. Dante went, right? They, their role was to deploy in this thin 
line in front of the larger battle line and to try to break through with a single charge to the corresponding enemies uh, uh, the line and that was also Fedito. The battle was fought against Arezzo, right? And that was a bitter enemy of Florence. Florence was wealth. Uh, Arezzo Ghibelline, more of that difference later. Um, and uh, the Florentines would win the battle. Also big thanks to the uh, to the intervention of the uh, their reserve um, led by Corso Donato himself. So you see the names that recur also in here. But in the first impact, the um, Aretine Feditori actually uh, basically annihilated the Florentine ones. So Dante remembers in a letter that is not uh, doesn't we don't have any more, but an author later on in the 14th century had read and that he was stating that he had had a lot of fear. And in fact, if you study the battle, you know that the Florentine territory had been overwhelmed, been uh, annihilated by uh, the enemy. So he, Dante was probably run over. Like you know, uh, either he was you know thrown off a horseback. We we don't know these details, but surely he had risked his life quite directly, and that was his business, his living. And even this voluntary role is is remarkable, right? And um, worth consideration. Think about the ideals that moved this person as a knight. How many people did ever know that Dante was a knight in the figure of, of the poet and all that thing? This was reality, right? And who knows how many other Dante were killed in, in the Italian wars of those years and how much we may have missed. And surely we went very close to that too at Campaldino in 1289. Uh, the Florentines actually knocked out Arezzo with that battle. They had its, uh, the the, Ar the Aretines in that battle were put up Probably the probably the single bitterest uh, res resistance in the you know the Italian wars in, in in an arc of sixty years at least, right? The the single sheer uh, you know push in the charge the attack was something so devastating that's never been seen and even they fought to the death. It was an extremely bloody battle that in fact is remembered by Dante in the comedy. There is also the episode of uh, the Montefeltro that had been killed, the, the, the episode of the angel, very touching moments actually. Uh, the angel and the devil that were contending, you know, the soul, right? And uh, since the, the body of this knight had not been found after the battle where a violent storm had unleashed, you know, Dante tells the story that basically this guy would have been pierced in his neck and falling, and it being a sinner, as some of the most radically violent individuals in that society like knights were by by definition he would bleed out while bleeding out he fell by uh, a stream next to, to to the battlefield and he called uh, he repented for his sins and he called the name of the virgin so according to the story in the comedy the devil arrives and he wants to take his own uh, soul because says this is a sinner Right, and the angel says no because he has repented and he 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 will go to heaven and 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 the devil says something like but just for a little tear to save the sinner's life and, and the devil can't do anything against redemption and he uh, and the angel took away the soul but the devil says okay but then i will take away the body and he says you know that in the storm all this the water that had swollen the, the stream brought uh, away the corpse of this knight that was very famous was son of one of the greatest commanders in um, in Italy at the time that had also um, fought uh, with with a, um, there are important stories about this and uh, was never found was there, the corpse was never found again so that gives you the, the sense of bitterness but of also of moral elevation and, and, and sensitivity and it's one of the single most moving passages if you read it from the war. Dante also fought at the siege of Caprona against the Pisans. This was a, a Pisan castle, right? The garrison surrendered at some point to the Florentines and Dante uses this also in the comedy to says, you know, as I saw the prisoners at Caprona also we approached to uh, that was an episode from the Inferno also uh, that, that there were some devils that were actually 
portrayed as a mercenary company of these thugs that you know populated um, the, those realities that were approaching. And Dante said, you know, I fear, I, 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 I feared so much as much as I saw the peasants fearing at Caprona when they came out, because when they came out, there were some agreements about saving life. It were somewhat standardized, but till the last moment, you couldn't know if you would have been butchered or not. Um, so Dante would go on fighting at some, you know, in many of the uh, other wars that uh, will start, especially after the exile, that we just don't know as much, but we, we know he probably was at some point somewhere and he fought, and it was hosted also by the, by the single most powerful and uh, most reactive sceneries uh, in center northern Italy. But at this time, when it, this is typical, we do say, you find it also, also in other countries. Think about the Minazenga, right? There are lots also of Germans that are coming to fight in Italy at this point. You know, some of the most single, most violent people that you can ever imagine, but that would have a, one of the greatest poetic sensitivities ever to write, uh, you know, courtly poetry, etc. Well, th this is exactly what, what Dante did at the same time. He, w he was a knight, but he also composed, he studied. He studied, he studied po he wrote poetry mostly, and he becomes close with uh, other men of letters and poets, and his principal points of reference are from one side, uh, the uh, probably most famous figure of communal intellectual that is represented by Brunetto Latini. Now Brunetto Latini is a beautiful figure, he recurs. Uh, in the comedy as well, he goes to hell as well, not because of uh, any of Dante's, uh, you know, bad uh, opinion on him, but to show that even great figures for certain specific scenes, that is also very meta allegorical in, in a sense, you know, um, and, or, and or metaphorical, because for some we don't even know factually whether it's the historical reality, but in the poem, you know, it fits like that. Um, uh, Brunetto had, uh, had, had had a similar life to Dante because he was exiled from Florence after the uh, Guelph defeat at Montaperte in 1260. He had fled to France while, um, uh, the, uh, while Florence was taken over by the Ghibellines, right at the time allied with Manfred uh, of, Sway of, uh, you know, of Sicily the same once against eventually the Angevins would come back, etc. And he lived as, a, as an exile, uh, composing in France, because it was normal, uh, Italy and France were dramatically close, right? A great part of what Dante's um, liter literary background uh, fell was the all the, medi the, the Sicilian mediated Provencal, but also Northern French literature, and many Italians at this point wrote their work in French actually. And uh, Dante was about to write the comedy in French, and thank God he, he didn't, um, because of the, the sheer magnitude and impact it would have had properly on humanism, on, on the Renaissance, on the long run, and, but that tells you how deep uh, the connection with that literature really was, and it's all about courtly and uh, the idea that the Italians went beyond, as we will see with certain particular authors. Brunetto ha was more of a treatise worker, um, an encyclopedist even. He had gone to Spain uh, in a diplomatic... Uh, eventually he came back to Florence when the Guelphs came back in, uh, and he was... Uh, he was part of the government. He was sent as an ambassador in Spain to uh, to ask for help to to some you know to to, to Castile. Um, Florence here, I, I want to stress it is at the center of European policy because it passes all like was the the single most important uh, city in central northern Italy relatively to the papal Angevin axis that was established after twelve. Uh, 66, 68, when the, the Angevins had secured the control of Naples, right? So the Guelphs in Italy were fundamentally this papal Angevin side. The Ghibellines were theoretically pro-imperial, but still the, there was, and theoretically also the Guelphs were pro-papal. In, 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 in different, uh, as we will explain now, naturally the, the local matters also took over by a certain dimension, but still there was this greater scheme, let's say, in in, interna in universal terms, that is also at, at the root of Dante's political vision, um, and so on. 
And so Brunetto was an exile that also wrote uh, some. The Tresor is, is a, in, Fra in uh, Langue d'Oille is specifically the most important work, but he also wrote uh, a Tesoretto in, in Florentine, in Italian. And that is similar to the comedy because it's essentially he talks about this condition of uh, his condition of exile and the pro the, all the moral problems deriving from it and meeting with allegorical figures, all references to the past. It's somewhat similar to the comedy. So it would, Dante was surely influenced by this great intellectual, great politician, and so on. Um, then uh, a closer friend would have been. Um, um, Guido Cavalcanti, that was also another knight like him. Also, here it is similar in origin. Nobility, uh, the Cavalcanti were probably French or German, also in ancestry. Um, the um, uh, these poets belonged to what the same Dante would define in the comedy as dolce stil novo, which in Italian means a sweet new style. It was essentially a sublimation of what had been courtly poetry and love. Right, especially the love was central in all this. It was about the, the moral, and physical strains brought by love and by these angelic women that would appear, such as Beatrice in the same uh, Dante experience, fundamentally a supernatural figure that would inspire divine uh, perfection and love, right, embodying them at the same time. This is also a theme that uh, goes on. Think about Patrick and Laura and all these things, and it's always uh, lots of things recur. Right, uh, the French connection, the Tuscans, all these things, and um, the uh, Tuscany was the most fervent era. The, the Silnova had been born in Bologna, actually. There is northern Italy, but just next side of uh, the other side of the Apennine is Florence, right, immediately northeastern Tuscany, and um, uh, Guininzelli was one of the most famous. But Cavalcanti becomes the, the greatest exponent of that um, uh, literary current. And uh, he was a, a very a very great figure. He he was not just a poet but a philosopher. Boccaccio says that he was the greatest logician of his own time. And Dante calls Guido Cavalcanti the first friend, meaning the, the most important friend, to whom he also would dedicate a dreamy sonnet, right? The one that says, you know, uh, Guido, I would like that uh, you, uh, Lapo and I were taken by enchantment, all leaving. You have to imagine living in a world like in the end of the 13th century is still it's not, not much so secularized people believed in magic in, in the in idea of course this literally was ideal but they like to live in this emotional reality in this um, uh, in, in ways that medieval civilization transmitted us we know these people lived way more intensely things like love hate um, life altogether Right, they were very um, bloody individuals in, in many ways. They had a, a temper. Uh, you see the, the life experiences that they went through. Consider Guido Cavalcanti was married um, to uh, the daughter of Farinata uh, degli Uberti, that was also one of the greatest politicians. In, had been at, in, in Florence. He he was a Ghibelline. Had been fundamentally the head of the Florentine Ghibellines at the the, the Guelph defeat of Montaperti, he had spared at the Council of Empoli Florentine uh, the Florence to be raised to the ground because the Guelphs wanted to, to take it out. But even if he was a, a, Gib a Ghibelline, he was a Florentine, right? So his mon municipal pride would say, no, you can't destroy it. And this is another figure like Corso Donati of the great... Uh, he, his name was actually Manente, but he was known as Farinata because he looked... He, he was... Uh, his hair was so platinum and blonde that he would look like floor. Um, and still at the time, that uh, the chivalric idea of beauty that knights had since the, the idea of, for example, having long hair, being blonde, having blue eyes, we know most of these figures also had. They were taken, maybe also for some ethnic divide that still existed in terms of the um, uh, older Ger Germanic rulers, but also the Italic ideas of this the idea of the, this blonde figures in mythology in, in, in India were some kind of noble that had an hour, a prestige. They were admired for their might, their power, their military prowess, their clientele, their wealth, right? The world start was were starting to become truly wealthy, right? The 13th century, uh, properly from Florence, the world started to be wealthy. So they, they were leaving certain... Um, exaltations, certain ideas that never been seen, and that's why 
such literature booms and that's why these are the most advanced areas in the world because properly it's 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 that sap of 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 civilization that produces such ideas such um refinement such intelligence such knowledge properly finding the time the resources just to study right these people these friends hang around they fought they loved they uh, they, they studied as well so a full life uh, in many ways so the woman sung by dante in the majority of his uh, love poems is famously we said before beatrice Probably uh, she was Bice Portinari, that uh, was married to um, Simone de Barti. It was a, de Barti were, uh, it's a name that recurs in Florence because they were some of the wealthiest bankers, the ones that also would have branches in Naples, the, the ones that would collapse because of all, you know, the, the, the crisis of the 14th century would bring down you know, lots of problems in England and France. Um, to, to which these families were all connected by by international ties. They 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 this basically all the wars fought in in Europe at the time had something to do with Italian moneylenders, right? They were financed, but from from the and that's why you wonder why this city was the center of this all. Well, exactly for this reason, they were the ones who had the money, right? And Beatrice, sadly enough, passed away prematurely in 1290. So this is. One of the first, um, you know, sparks that in that you know, triggered um, Dante's um, um, commitment, uh, he, he desperation. Let's say that, uh, as we were saying before, this love was quite ideal. We know that Dante loved many women in his life, also not very, you know, um, a pure one, <laughs> seemingly. Uh, even when he was married, everywhere he went, would know he he met some, you know. A peasant girl in I don't know where in, in Tuscany that she, she went with other you know you can't imagine this was normal at the time actually marriage was arranged at all these things but um, uh, Beatrice especially uh, even though she they lived in Florence they saw each other all, at least at a distance etc and she was married to this other powerful man like they couldn't interfere uh, in, in, the, in the process but you know their contacts were probably rare and occasional right uh, they there was probably really nothing um uh, even you know, specifically physical ab about that and but this is exactly the point because the still novist love is fed of distance and of impossibility right so by taking on uh, the uh, the the radical elan and devotion uh, in uh, Guinizelli's uh, literary conception, Dante sees in Beatrice the supreme ideal. So the synthesis of spiritual values that give sense to life. Which is a very beautiful idea if you think about it. You, you, medieval civilization had revived the centrality of the virgin of this, uh, this womanly figure that dominated here the inspiration and then the, so it, love here is sublimated in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, as we've seen, uh, life customs were much more, um, you know, material in a sense. But, you know, it, 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 it's still very important. We don't have to think that it was just anecdotal. Or and the story of this inner love is sung in the Vita Nuova, the new life, uh, composed between 1292 and 1295. By Dante, uh, in which work he uh, makes an evaluation, let's say, of uh, of the affective and intellectual experience of the author after the deep crisis caused by Beatrice's death. Right, as we were saying before, think to live in a world where death is so easier um, and taking away also so many we don't know but it's likely that Beatrice as many women of the time actually died of of, late, of, of birth of, of childbirth so these are the things like uh, women in the in the bloom of youth taken away by I don't know sepsis or anything you know dying miserably in this and you you can find they yeah they had a lot of children it was this was normal this was in theorizing this time this doesn't mean that people suffered less in absolute terms 
right? And we have to understand properly this, even if, as we've seen, Dante surely killed somebody at some, with his own hands, uh, and or, uh, you know, he, he's, that was, you see, uh, political revenge in the city, people tortured each other, dueled, it, it was uh, a mess for our own standards of public security so the entire world was like that but it, it's exactly the thing this beauties this this figure these angelic ideals that would by time would would give this message of maybe that better world that has yet to come and of course dante gave to beatrice one of the probably the greatest uh, role that uh, you can and, and thanks and uh, gifts that you can give to a loved one uh, in in the comedy where she truly embodies that perfection, that beatitude, and, and that, uh, yeah, and um, they are moving lines when you read them. They, you don't have to keep them for granted. What, what do you think? Uh, we, we can all relate to that because we, we got all smitten over some, some, somebody at some point. You think that girl, she, you know, you, you idealize her. Right, you feel as if she is everything to you she wants. And it, it's exactly that feeling. But in a world that is much more much more cruel, in a sense, than our own. Right? And where are those angelic figures today? Right? Assuming that they ever existed, but truly where is the will of properly corresponding to that? Because even among women there was of course um uh, correspondence to these vows, these ideas, especially in the nobility, because you have to understand also that the nobility was the one that had this higher moral, you know, standard and uh, demand properly, because they had to show society they were up to the task in a moral sense, as we were saying before, as these great barons, as these great leaders, as the, they were essentially mafia bosses, let's be honest about it, the, the entire Middle Ages were fundamentally just about mobsters and their retinues and there is no other way to read it uh, like in any pre-industrial reality so um they were extremely pressured because they they had pro they were responsible for their surroundings properly as in the lack of a well florence had an incipient state going on right and that's also in part what dante would have been victim of as we will see but the values that knighthood the chivalry that never was never killed Right, you not even these urban societies that were essentially just mirroring the feudal ones completely in man, in many ways, just a slightly different wealth distribution. But at, at the end, of the, in practice, right, these were lords, and as such, they had uh, uh, a duty. Um, so, in, in order to react, so in the same around the same years, um, uh, in order to react to this comfort brought by Beatrice's death. Um, Dante started philosophical studies in the Franciscan and Dominican uh, monasteries of Florence. And the consolation of philosophy, surely inspired by Boetius, the work, etc., is so great that according to Dante himself, as he wrote in the, uh, the other work of Convivia, uh, said in a short time, maybe 30 months, his love um, sh showed and destroyed any other thought. So Dante takes refuge in philosophy, in studying, learning. And it's the research of the ideal perfection that animated the uh, still novice poems for Beatrice that takes now a, a more markedly and explicitly moral character. And in fact Dante in the meanwhile also mm, dedicates himself passionately to political activity with the intention to literally build that reality uh, in reality that justice and truth that he had found theorized in the books of philosophers and theologians um, so Florence was pretty uh, pretty active politically militarily socially as we were saying before so Dante um, you know, uh, you see, at this point, central northern Italy was almost completely hegemonized by the Papal Angevin Axis, the Guelph one. Florence, as we've seen, was a, a uh, the, the most important center of this axis, and yet uh, it was such a, a based area with su such 
diversified interest so many cities so many f figures powers uh, wealth etc that it was difficult for 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 this axis to be a truly compact reality right and at the end of the day the papacy uh, and the Angevins were trying to control more directly certain centers of powers including Florence right Pope Boniface VIII, we talked about him, he's one of the most famous and capable popes in history, and everybody thinks that he was a monster or whatever, and Dante surely contributed to the thing that, of course, predicts the fact he would have gone to hell and all these things. But actually, if you study the real, I mean, real history from real history books, you understand that this guy was actually a freaking, you know, was one of the greatest popes ever. He was an incredibly capable, shrewd, and surely, um, you know, merciless, but intelligent per he worked for his own interest as everybody did at the time i'm i'm kind of you know i don't even know if it's naivety or simple uh, let not let <laughs> let's not be insulted here but like you know what what do you think like why every single power on earth would work for his own benefit and why wouldn't the roman church do it right uh, unfortunately we live in realities that are still impressed by you know confessional clashes people can't see things straight but just study real history because you know that's another favor you can make and boniface wanted definitely to extend uh, powerful control on florence in all its wealth and you know catalyzing this process of strengthening of the papacy properly as a territorial entity in central italy and so on so this is a delicate moment. Dante mm, proposes to give his own contribution to bring the Concord among the Florentine uh, citizens and to defend the autonomy of the city. And here there were two sides within the same Guelphism, right? Uh, because the Guelphs had, as we've seen, the blacks and the whites. Um, what was the difference practically? Well, the blacks were. Uh, the, the most hardcore uh, Papal Angevin supporters and they were essentially represented by the, the elite of the of the people right the, the Guelphs in general you see the, the first of all the Guelphs in general were more popular oriented the word the the toward originally had been let's say siding more uh, against imperial power and therefore against this, the lords that the emperors would appoint to govern the single cities so tendentially they were more like the popolo in, in, in there but the popolo had become dramatically wealthy fast so basically for those same crit democratic criteria we've seen before many populars were actually knights themselves they they were exceedingly wealthy they in florence specifically they controlled the arts right so they they elected the priori that were also dante would be part of that so uh, they the, the blacks were mostly from that kind of elite and more internationally tied uh, part of the Welfs. The whites instead were the the, the more you know the, the, still the the more the, the, the crafts the, the the smaller activities the you know the average citizens would wanted to make a living without falling to somebody's orbit necessarily etc. So a, a bit in a sense the more democratic side. Now. Uh, Dante, famously enough, would choose the whites, right? Because, uh, as Boccaccio said, he believed in his own judgment this was the one with the, the side with more reason and justice. Now, this is important to stress because um, uh, f for a while, uh, you see, blacks and, wh and whites among the, the Guelphs had were a, a recently, um, a, a relatively recent thing. It had spread uh, exactly because Guelphism was so large in Italy now that, as we were saying before, the further divisions would occur. The Ghibellines always remain compact. Um, the truth being also that, differently from the Ghibellines that sided with the, the ideal of imperial authority and um, greater affirmation of its uh, government in the peninsula would receive helps from Germany, etc., the Guelphs never had the same, like the, the papacy never managed to develop in, 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 in Guelphism the same cohesion of political ideology, right? Because in theory, the papacy had to be just a papacy, thinking about spiritual matters. So there was n n n never, like, I don't know, thinking that the Angevins, for example, um, or St. Papacy were 
an ideal to die with, whereas the Ghibellines really thought that dying for the Empire was a good thing, right? So uh, it was a bit more an hypocritical reality from the wealth side, um, and it was a way to benefit of the stability provided by the Angevin power that stretched from, from the, uh, the channel to, to the agency. Uh, it had provided stability, spread advancement, it's, you know, a certain degree of pacification, but still the city-states all thought kind of their own way. And um, it's important to stress this difference because literary texts st st uh, stress the fact that Dante, as you know, he would, as we understand here, he would be exiled as a white uh, from Florence. And in fact, Florence would remain a black uh, Guelph a power. The whites were definitely, at that point, seeking refuge among the Ghibellines. And fundamentally, the two sides overlap. I had the opportunity to study a bit f this reality, and I can assure you that for there is no doubt that in, at, at least from a practical political and military point of view, when you read white in this context, you read Ghibelline, right? There is no doubt of sort, right? D Dante probably from an ideological point of view surely believed that he wanted to be a, still a Guelph and a white Guelph in, in this sense, and that he wasn't quite gibble in himself, but de facto, de facto, they the word the same thing, right? Literally, they fought like with, with the same gibbling powers all the time. You you never find like, for example, an independent white wealth power being opposed to the gibbelings uh, uh, and 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 the blacks. Uh, no, it, it's always about uh, white exiles always going into gibbling cities, lordships, and that's it. Right, always. So even though I appreciate the ideological distinction, I still believe that in practice there was much more. You can't really equate wise to Ghibellines in a, in a sense. So much that Fosco, for example, talking about Dante, also said he called him the Ghibelline. He he was essentially correct, at least in terms of international affiliation. One problem is that, uh, albeit we know where Dante roamed around Italy and mostly Ghibelline powers, um, indeed. Um, we, we don't know how much he actually, for example, participated to military operations, whatever. We know he, he, he counseled, he advised uh, these um, Ghibelline lords, he did also the, the emperor, etc. So he was practically a Ghibelline, yeah, too. Um, in the case of Florence, um, when he was, uh, you see, uh, Dante entered politics. Uh, he opposed repeatedly to the papal demands without being uh, without uh, being scared by the threats of excommunication. In 1301, he was elected among the six priori of Florence. Right, so he was properly in, in the in the Florentine at the top of the Florentine government, and at that point, he was extremely, we you know, mm, cold. About it, he didn't hesitate to condemn to exile um, uh, uh, the s loss of people, uh, especially the most violent hands of the counterposed factions, and even members of his own party, including the friend Guido Cavalcanti, and that he would have had on his conscience because um, Guido uh, was exiled and he died basically the year after, probably of malaria. So Dante was directly responsible for that, and that was surely another great blow. But that's how highly he thought of his political role, and that ju ideal of justice he had matured. Dante is sentenced to, you know, refunding or cutting some somebody's tongue, right? You know, uh, that was the law, right? As we will see, he was also condemned to be burned at the stake, so, you know, and he escaped, like, by almost practically by chance, right? So that's yet another um, circumstance for which we could have, we might have lacked, in fact, the single greatest author in medieval um, uh, civilization. But without that context, we would have not had him because all his reflections of politics on life and the universal, un universal power, the world, afterlife, etc., would have not ha occurred if he had not lived in this specific civilization. And... In, in, 1301 is the same year in which the situation uh, degenerates because exactly while Dante is in Rome 
as member of um, a, a diplomatic mission uh, to by the, to Boniface the Eight. Some context the fact that he actually ever got to Rome, but let's say he was out of Florence where um, um, where a, a coup uh, properly backed by the papacy brought the blacks to power. Right. Uh, essentially, what happened is that the army of uh, Charles of Valois, that was the son of the French king, marched on be on behalf of the Pope on 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 the city. The truth there is is kind of darker, meaning that surely there was a lot of mess in the city going on. There were perturbations, and part of the same of the same Dante, Dante's government had brought, in a sense, to to, to this, um, and. Uh, in that sense, the papal French Andrew in Axis enters the city. Dante w would call this guy the the, the fake pa pacifier. Let's say the, the the one who would arrive to make peace. Actually, he uh, started the 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 repression that he was victim of. In fact, what actually occurred was sacks, persecutions, summary trials, and having been uh, accused. Of having opposed to the Pope and to have uh, actually stolen public money, um, the the name of the accused was Bartry, right? So it was a kind of corruption fundamentally, and was a very common uh, accusation if you wanted to knock out a, um, a politician at the time. Dante was condemned initially to a fine and two years of exile, but uh, such accusation was false and infamous. So Dante refuses to present himself in Florence, this circumstance, and in 1302 he is condemned in absentia to be burned alive. That's where he actually made it to escape uh, in a situation that might have gone differently, but this is just to, to say how much he lived by. At that point, of course, the situation in Florence wasn't very inviting to him. As we've seen, he, he had basically already been exiled uh, on paper, but the, the, the question being that he would have probably gotten, he probably didn't accept the accusation, he thought there was nothing there to come back for, and he would have been humiliated, but he, he wouldn't accept that. Right, and f so this is the crucial moment. This is the moment from which Dante is cut off from his city. That many years after, close to his death, he will remember still as um, the the beautiful ship pen where I slept as a lamp, enemy of the wolf that gave him war. Uh, this is Paradise Twenty Five, by the way. And um, so exile is uh, arguably the single most important uh, event in Dante's life. It's literally a trauma. Think properly even about the municipal pride, like, uh, uh, contrarily what was commonly said, there was a, an, an idea of uh, Italianness at the time. Dante himself is the proof of that. He he wrote extensively about it, but still, it was very different from from what we think in modern terms. Meaning that uh, basically every city state mostly reasoned with its own mind. Like they, uh, Italians were Italians when they were abroad, but when they were in Italy, they were the Florentines, the, the Milanese, the Bolognese, etc. So, as you understand, the city. Also, by those medieval standards, it's so much as Italian cities had grown. These were the largest cities in the world. Were something new. It, it, it's as if they had been a universe on the on, on their own. In the previous centuries, the, the, literally, what is in, in within the city gates is something, right? What is outside is the unknown, right? It's it's literally a universe on its own. It's how medievals saw the world. University, right? That's a term that we discussed also recently. Properly, is the idea of being turned all towards a common purpose, and and Dante's purpose was definitely uh, the well welfare of Florence in itself from his point of view as a Florentine. So uh, this is to be understood deeply, right? The municipal pride and identity and and um, and this constant uh, bitter feeling, humiliation, desperation of, of being taken away from, from from your home, not being able to come back and, and worse that 
for, for a political reason that, that is you know your opponents are there and they're enjoying your absence and exploiting benefiting from that persecutions were 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 extremely cruel like houses were destroyed um, towers taken down uh, lands uh, uh, goods confiscated right so we're talking about a disaster literally it, it is really a trauma and with the risk probably of being killed at some point also because as we've seen that Dante was condemned to to be burned at the stake now as he would say in the same um, convivio he thought of himself like a ship without sail and without helmsman uh, brought to uh, different ports and uh, harbors and coasts by the dry wind that uh, uh, the painful poverty uh, emanates right and in fact imagine that you have literally lost all your your properties that these people were always as noblemen always uh, always with some retinue with some possession of course he wasn't a beggar but he writes you know uh, i was a peregrine almost mendicating yes but still at a nobler level among the um, seigneurial courts of central and northern italy as a political refugee that surely could that was a bit the uh, very characteristic of this reality because um Florence wasn't definitely the only city that had exiles. Every once in a while there was somebody making a coup in the, in the city-state. Uh, the, there were roughly 30 cities doing all the same things at this point, and therefore there was always some exile that would try to come back. Right, M Many of them remained in the countryside, uh, especially when the commune was weaker and they had their possessions, their castles. Others, literally, as Dante went, less, uh, you know, but in ability, etc., would go somewhere else and he, since he was a learned man and uh, also a prestigious figure he had been as we've seen at the head of florentine government uh, etc he was an important political pawn to be hosted by, uh, at the courts of these great lords that appreciated his presence and uh, um, of which they offered hospitality that was humiliating for dante that is another recurring uh, theme of in his work but you can't imagine they were very proud people as we were saying these were knights aristocrats they they felt um, properly deprived of their own their own honor by being thrown out so it was a painful experience and there is also another beautiful uh, beautiful phrase um, that uh, refers to the fact that he would serve essentially his other lords and says that how he would uh, he he did learn uh, this is a prophecy actually in the paradise 17 because he writes in a distance of years he actually he's already in the future living on but essentially making the comedy as a prophecy of things would happen that he would have experimented how bitter how salty um, uh, other people's bread is so the bread of other cities of other places and how what what a hard road is to um, um, come up and down uh, other people's ladders right and uh, this was a reality also a precarious one because as we were saying before because of all the political military instability the various upheavals uh, you could never be completely safe right uh, the the governments were always trying to to knock each other's out uh, in turn uh, and and to make coups um, you know invasions things like that it, it was a very turbulent reality but it is exactly the harshness of the exiles experience the awareness to be paying unjustly for his uh, choices of, of justice and of truth as the he saw them um, reinforce in in Dante a strong sense um, of superiority towards the violence and the intrigues of a corrupt political life that surely was the norm at the time and uh, and he said the exile that has been given to me I keep as a honor right and he stated in a in a poem written shortly after his condemnation uh, at the, the same uh, reference actually and and uh, again in 1315 he refused to um, 
to stay under the, the uh, humiliating conditions of an amnesty that had been granted to the exiles that would uh, grant him to come back in, belo in the beloved Florence. 1315 um, is the year of the Florentine defeat of Montecatini at the hands of uh, uh, the, the Pisan lord, Uguccione della Fagiola. That was one of these military dynasties living in the Apennines, some rough men like the Montefeltro, etc., that sold their services as podestas, political leaders and military leaders. Montecatini is one of the single most important battles in, in the European Middle Ages. We're talking about 30,000 men per side, literally. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of the most complete tactical um, realizations in medieval history. There, there is everything. There is use of wings, of, um, of hidden uh, part of the three lines, um, of uh, cooperation between uh, cavalry and crossbows, pikemen. There is everything, literally everything. We will have make a video about that. So the Florentines and the Angevins, because the commander-in-chief of the Guelph army was uh, nonetheless the Prince Philip of Taranto, so literally that w they were the Angevin dynasty themselves, and uh, even a nephew of the, of, of the King of Naples would be killed there. Th this were French blood, they were Capetians, right? They were royalty, Europe. and the peasants defeated them. Also, thanks to the German veterans of Henry VII, who we'll talk about in a while, that had remained been hired by Pisa, that had a freaking lot of money for doing that, and it was the most important battle of the of the era, and uh, it was a, an utter bloodbath, right? So basically, the Florentine countryside had been exposed now to, to these German raiders of Guccione, and um, so it was in use at the time to when such crisis occurred to call back all the exiles because this would compact the city right against a common threat because even political divisions at that point would be uh, superseded uh, on because of the properly the risk of the city being conquered by another power but Dante refuses because still there were humiliating clauses as we've seen now it's fascinating that Dante himself had been thrown out of Arezzo because when he was exiled he was probably in Arezzo fighting against Florence from the east. Um, that tells you how important these um, Guelph and Ghibelline things were because he would fight against the same Florence because it was against the same enemies, right? And uh, Ugochone for certain political mechanism basically took, told Dante and, his, um, and this other white and, and uh, part of the Ghibelline um, exiles to go away. Because there were still the, the, the Florentine Ghibelline exiles, you know, this, if, if, for since the time of um, Manfred, etc., uh, and all the, the Guelph um, popular government had been re established after the affirmation of the Andrews. So you understand how complicated it is. So Dante knew Guccione. Uh, and, and Guccione had become Lord of Pisa. Eventually, after a couple of years, Montecatini, he, he, uh, he was exiled by Pisa as well, because he had made Pisa spending too much money for the military. And Guccione went, uh, f f as an exile, to the north, in Verona, by the De La Scala dynasty, where also Dante was, <laughs> as a refugee. And that's quite fascinating, because it tells you how, not much how small the world was, but technically how much these people traveled and how much intertwined this reality was, right? And to, to um, and so you can imagine here how much Dante cared also about his own name to be properly restored, to refuse to come back to Florence, where he wouldn't, he would never come, right? It can, as we will see, it's kind of bitter to see how he died uh, shortly after having fully the, the possibility of coming back to Florence without uh, any kind of uh, condition. And that's also very... just after having finished the paradise, by the way. So, if we had to look at on the map where Dante was uh, after his uh, exile around uh, Italy and possibly abroad, but it's debatable. So, in 1303, around but there is a lot of debate in this chronology, by the way. Uh, he was host of uh, Bartolomeo, Bartolomeo della Scala in Verona. He, so he went to Verona first. Verona, as we were saying before, was a Ghibelline power. It was one of, one of the few uh, Ghibelline powers remained in Italy. And later on, uh, basically, properly the seat of the imperial bickery. 
uh, of Italy after the, the imperial expedition of Henry VII. Um, then in 1304, Dante moves to Treviso, that is in the northeast of Verona, still in the Venetian area, uh, among the Dacamino Signory, that was that were a lesser power that interfered, uh, was a military, another military line lineage that uh, interfered with the Trevisan Commune as well, etc. Then, possibly he stayed in Padua between 1304-1305. The Paduans were fundamentally uh, Guelphs, were still not at war. The, the war in the Venetian area f would start from 1311, at least the major one between Verona and Padua. So this was still a time in which Dante could stay in a Guelph center without too much problem in there. Then he probably stayed in Bologna in 1304-1305, and there is reason to believe that he also participated to uh, in, in 1304 to an attempted coup to Florence itself, the Battle of the Lastra, that, by the way, is the same day in which uh, Petrarca was born, <laughs> and part of the Aretinians, in fact, where he was born in Arezzo, he, because his father was another Florentine exile, by the way, that had stayed in Arezzo, and basically Bologna at this time was a white Guelph power, which means that it was virtually Ghibelline, and he had given shelter to these white and Ghibelline exiles of Tuscany and launching up this expedition together with other Ghibelline powers, the, the Guidi Counts, all these lords of the Apennine, etc., and Arezzo against Florence. Possibly Dante was there, participating to the battle that the Florence was almost without garrison, but they managed to resist and actually um, uh, showing out, pushing out the invaders, taking catapults in the city streets, by the way. So this, these are the kind of atmospheres you have to imagine. Uh, Bologna eventually would revert to black Guelphism, actually, um, and go on like that as a major Guelph power, strong ally of Florence, by the way. Um, in 1306, Dante was in the um, uh, host of the Malaspina, that were uh, power in the northwestern Apennines. Uh, these were also a very important military uh, lineage that had a, a crucial strategic um, role in the crossings between Tuscany and Lombardy. And they were revered all over Ghibelline Italy because they had, tr had a tremendous skill. They were present in every war, in every situation, and, and he stayed there for a while. Then he came back to Verona for a longer uh, for a longer stay, at the time of the famous Cangrande. Cangrande was one of the greatest commanders in late communal Italy, Ghibelline, as we've seen, and uh, he he was appointed by Henry the Seventh of Luxembourg as imperial vicary of Italy. He basically controlled the, the Venetian area, and he um, he got together with Verona also Vicenza, from which he started the war against Padua. It was one of the bloodiest conflicts at the time. And um, it's a very interesting... Uh, he spent his life on horseback. And he was, however, also a magnate. It was very interesting letters, etc. So he's very famous. Dante would dedicate the paradise of his comedy to Cangrande himself. And also flattering him, in, you know, as um, there is some hint in the... Ma some metaphors and maybe thinking that Cangrande was seen as the that the man would make the difference in Italy at the time. Definitely the La Scala were very powerful. Together with the Visconti in Lombardy, they were essentially the strongest power, as we were seeing before, in the era. It would expand later on. Then, um, uh, in uh, he was in Ravenna in 1319, uh, uh, at the service of Guido Novello da Polenta, that was the lord of the city, and he would die, as we will see now, in Venice in 13. Um, actually, uh, along the way, in, in, uh, in 1321, he went to Venice for a diplomatic mission on behalf of the Da Polenta. And while he was coming back to Ravenna in these um, Venetian swamps, etc., he s fell sick, probably with malaria, and he died. Some say that he was maybe in Paris in 1310. This is not clear. At all, but let's say that given he knew French, it's, you know, he was a pretty international intellectual, very similar to Brunetto Latini. He he would have 
there would have been not it would have been so strange after all now such situation of literally of extraction of uh, exile of whatever you want to call it of properly being cut off from his fatherland brought very important consequences on the cultural and ideological level for Dante because for him as he said in the De Vulgari Eloquentia which is another these are all works that we're going to see in the next videos right we'll see them in detail so we understand also much better in detail what his ideology, uh, ideology was right he stated that the world is father land to me he says as water is to fish right so properly understanding it now he was a uh, a citizen of the world and uh, since he had blood and he saw even more strongly his universal mission he's literally an evangelic one a prophetical one um, the, the the commedia was uh, uh, the commedia as we were saying before was literally meant to have the same four levels of biblical uh, symbology the, he was surely also very you know, you can't imagine the ego of a person who writes something like that. It doesn't have to be underestimated, but it still fits in that universalistic mindset of certainty and rationalism and properly scientific understanding of the world that we'll have to talk in detail when we'll see this, and but that we already discussed on Schwerpunkt when addressing properly what is that substantiates medieval civilization as such. Um with uh, Cavalcanti, for example, was uh, was even a borderline, uh, you know, heretic, considering that he had started, he believed something about the incorruptibility of the soul, etc., very, very close to the Averroistic Aristotelian interpretation. And so, these were people that studied literally the, the, the pinnacle of, you know, the philosophy, the science of at their time, right, and, and lived uh, along the, their opinions. Also, Dante, in a sense, says, can say properly open, openly heterodox things, but he, for example, he was the guy who invented the purgatory, for instance, because there wasn't such an idea before. Or even if there was, it wasn't uh, officialized, formalized. So Dante informed properly also an idea that we have of the Middle Ages that we felt to throw his own work, and then it was his own understanding. But the guy knew knew literally everything that, uh, that in these times we, we see the, the sheer amount of of philosophical scientific uh, historical geographical uh, religious re theolo re theological reference is astonishing in his work it, it, it's incredible that that's where you understand it that okay there, there were people at the time learning the bible by heart right and these men would do something something very similar right something that today we are not able to do anymore because simply we have a completely different way of learning these people would right uh, the exile the exile was led here even in relative misery he could bring a uh, very few books with him and he had to memorize in his brain and it's best hard disk that we can ever find right also with the best software to serve it by the way but yet we are late we're getting lazier and lazier today so, as a consequence of the exile, Dante's horizon is not restricted to Florentine society only. There are lots of references to Florence in, in his work and in the comedy. It's, a, it's obviously a, a Florentine work in a sense. But it's opened on Italy and on the entire Christendom. And Dante's um, life in this sense seems to assume a sort of exemplar value, as if uh, it was a, a sign, a proof, a uh, witness of the disorder and injustice that dominate the world. These were hard times, right? Here we are at the end of the 13th, the beginning of, of, of the 14th centuries. Th these are the moments of crisis, of recession, that in the West begin, start in... Uh, here, by the way, it's uh, the, the early 14th century in Italy is a con continuous war from Henry the Seventh campaign for 20 years o onward it's entirely about uh, war and nothing else that that's literally how also the the, the rise of italian scenarios the creation of regional states basically happened uh, before it was still the 30 city states all on their own here there was a dramatic process of political and social recompacting that had never been seen before and that that's where 
also humanism was born as but patriarch is the first uh, exponent of it was soaked into dante's work and uh, still there is much of you know humanism in, in dante in itself already for the interest towards the classics etc but in, yet in a in a more properly medieval sense um in a, in a universalistic sense and that's why also dante is somewhat uh, anachronistic because the world was opening to a different idea we'll see it better later on um and dante this, this is crucial he felt to be invested of a prophetic mission right a uh, bringer of a message that had to bring the entire humanity back to order and peace thus he decides to be part for himself by you know uh, to um you see um distancing from uh, all these other exiles that he at some point he d that were always up to retaking florence in arms always leaving at the outskirts making war in those frontiers raids bloodshed things like that he says you know these are he sees them as an evil and unpious company um, and um, because he he understood that this was also unfeasible in a sense because Florence was actually heading under the the black uh, government towards a, a dramatic style of compaction you know properly was developing a lot and um, securing consolidating and there was no way now the old way of the exiles uh, a bunch of knights trying to enter in the city while you know the city now could could mobilize literally the largest army in, in italy and you know it, it was it wasn't in facts would prove that because some also the the, the the greatest armies around couldn't force that 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 uh, balance as well so uh, so dante is realistic in this sense as well and therefore he starts he thinks he he was an idealist in, in a sense he, he he thinks that it's literary work that can make the difference so in 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 this he literally changes also his previous literary interest because he stops for example completely his uh, still novel experience to dedicate to works of scientific and philosophical meditation that is uh, also conjugated with an urgent religious political and moral inspiration so between 1304 and 1313 with a very few books at disposal and among this uh, during this continuous uh, moves from court to court he wrote these works as some of the most important the convivio the de vulgari eloquentia the inferno and the purgatorio which is a freaking lot and these are huge works by the way and not, not just because of the, the the quality of course that is the most important aspect but literally they're big works in itself now there is this other parenthesis because 1313 is not an anecdotal year um as we were saying before since 1310 1311 Italy, yeah there were normally wars around but uh, 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 basically from the uh, expedition of Henry the seventh in Italy everything changes um, Dante in all this um, believed that the only remedy for the political and moral degeneration of the world stood in the restoration of the two universal authorities an emperor uh, that has to know how to govern with force and justice Christendom and a Pope that had to dedicate totally to religious and spiritual problems so as it may seem strange you know the reality was further from from this because uh, the empire since the 13th century was the shadow of, of itself right uh, even these expeditions of Henry the seventh later on after Dante's death uh, Louis um, Ludwig of Wittelsbach and then well Charles of Bohemia technically wasn't even uh, excuse me of John of Bohemia wasn't even uh, was also his son there but he wasn't uh, emperor he wouldn't be emperor but we're always kind of shrinking down right the Henry the seventh expedition also the one of, of Ludwig the Bavarian were important actually they're very overlooked I had the pleasure of studying those campaigns entirely and they're very very fascinating they could have changed a big deal 
for real. Instead, also because of Dante's, uh, first of all, because of the failure of, of, of the imperial failure, but in general, also of Dante's resignation, we think, ah, no, no, you know, Henry VII expedition was doomed, there was no way that the empire would retake back the kingdom of Sicily. Well, this is actually not true. We are told that uh, still after the defeats collected in Tuscany against the Saint Florence, Henry VII in 1313, when he eventually died along the way, had managed to mobilize, not, we, we know that, an enormous army, and it was told that the, the Angevins in Naples didn't literally have an army to, to withstand them. So if they had marched in the south, they, they would have retaken uh, Naples. Then Sicily was Aragonese already, so that was a Ghibelline power as well. So they would have arranged some, some sort of, well, they would have surely become kind of enemies because at the end of the day, that's how the mechanism worked. But it, it could have factually changed a lot. And Herod the Seventh expedition did change a lot because he actually recompacted northern Italy under Ghibelline rule and given terrific power to these um, Ghibelline signories that rose ever more, ever stronger, the Visconti and the La Scala especially, but also in Tuscany reactivated a very important war with lots, especially Pisa, and look at it, you know, launched dramatic offensives that would culminate, as we've seen with Montecatini in 1315 and with Alto Pasha in 1325 uh, against Florence that was, you know, that suffered these uh, important, pitch battles, defeats that were quite meaningful uh, also for, for the results achieved from the other side. The papacy <laughs> was f further what it could be from being totally concerned only of religious and spiritual problems. The papacy was a state within states now and it was also frankly one of the single most advanced. Bureaucracy is born exactly in these years in Europe, uh, in the West, uh, with the papal Andrew in one in Naples, in, in Rome, in Avignon, in Paris. They couldn't be that, right? And the main problem was the, uh, the evident contrast existing between the papacy and the empire. You know, during the Henry VII uh, expedition, there was almost an agreement, actually, with the papacy at the beginning, but factually it was the Neapolitans and the Guelphs fighting against the Ghibellines and, and the Germans. So mm, that was... Uh, concretely the reality and the papacy had its own armies that fought some of the largest armies of the time look at the one they employed in the 20s of the 14th century against the Visconti for example in, they, they were about to take Milan and or the later one, the ones of uh, Bologna but also in Tuscany they, some papal legates some cardinals had levied impressive forces including from Arezzo partly um, you know uh, at the time at the times we're talking about here so there is really a lot. What, what happened with Henry VII of Luxembourg, you know, he was fundamentally the emperor that put, um, that re resumed uh, the uh, Romfart, the uh, Italian expedition, the, the, the Roman expedition, right? The Habsburgs with Rodolf in 1278 had put an end to the great interregnum, but he had remained just king of the Romans. Henry VII, he was essentially a French speaking. He was a Luxembourger. He, he, he got eventually the, the heirs that had the, the kingdom of Bohemia that would have that, that, that story also with John of Bohemia, Charles of Bohemia that went in Italy for the same, more or less for the same reasons, but in a completely different situation in terms especially of factual power that they could have in there, mostly paid by the same Italian powers for, for that matter. We made a video about that, that is foreign intervention in Italy during the 14th century. It can help maybe give a background. Henry VII expedition, he said, was a, a big thing. It was a very large army of 6,000 knights and who knows how many infantry that achieved mm, a lot of interesting things. He had arrived in Piedmont in 1310. In 1311, he um, besieged um, Brescia, and he there was this first blow. The, the the city surrendered was basically the most atrocious siege ever there. Um, and however, there was a, an epidemic um, that decimated the imperial army. Um, Henry VII's brother died because he was hit by a quarrel in the neck. Um, then the emperor moved to to central Italy. To, he passed to Gen from Genoa to Pisa, then there from Rome, to Rome, where he was crowned. 
in 1312 and then from Rome he moved to Florence. He put Florence under siege but he couldn't make an headway because the Florentines had gathered perhaps what is the largest army of the era there, 60,000 men, with all their the allies coming from literally half of Italy that was partaking for the Guelphs, the others for the Ghibellines, and the emperor was fundamentally uh, he, he, the imperial army dissolved into Tusk, in the Tuscan hills, harassed by guerrilla fighters, by the Catalans of the uh, Angevin Maniscal that was con uh, in, in, in Florence, the Florentine Cavallate that were these Florentine knights that were chosen as sort of um, you know elite group to, to harass the imperial. Uh, that there were atrocious fights in that sense. The plague again, and and then Henry the Seventh went to Pisa again. It was a Ghibelline power, so an enemy of Florence as well. He put together an enormous army again, with Italian money, with um, Ar Aragonese money, and he left for the south, for, for Naples, but where he was still in Tuscany, uh, and was besieging the city of, uh, the, the, burb, the town of, of Buonconvento, the emperor fell sick and died of malaria. Some say he was poisoned, but actually, but... Well, and, and so the whole freaking thing was aborted. As, as we've seen, much of the Transalpine mercenaries in Henry employment were, were actually hired by the peasants that led on the struggle with Oguccione for all the Italian Ghibellines and scoring that masterpiece of Montecatini. And from there on, a, an endless series of wars that now we don't have the time to tell, but that I would tell you gladly in detail at some point. And Dante, Dante saw in Henry, of which he probably met, he counseled, etc., a new Caesar, right? So after after a long time, uh, after the times of uh, literally of of Conradin, basically this was the 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 first Germanic German G Germanic, let's say better because most of his armies were like Burgundians more than Germans, like but still you know um, in Italy. You know, the first time the emperor came back in Italy to claim the crown, after a long time, well, the emperor, I mean, the would-be emperor that, in fact, here was crowned as such in Rome, but needed to go to Rome and seize Rome. There was a huge urban battle in 1312 in Rome, probably the largest urban battle, uh, possibly in the entire Middle Ages. It's, uh, but it's, um, you see how the magnitude of the events, and Honestly, I know that you have never heard about this. Like, un unless you're an expert about that specific moment, I would say you've never heard of it because nobody told you. When you went to school, you, you, nobody was interested in telling you what mattered. Was interested just to tell a, a concise story that has basically no meaning and to make you believe I don't, I don't know what. This is real history. This is the real one. This is not like a minor thing. This is the, the core of European events happening at the time. Uh, here the world powers were involved, France, Germany, the, the Papacy, the Italians, the Aragonese, uh, and beyond. Because here everything was intertwined with the English interests, the French, so did the, the, the Byzantines at the same time. It was that freaky mess up. And Dante was hoping that imperial authority would put an end to these brotherly uh, fights and that so that he could also come back to Florence, by the way. In fact, he um, commenting the uh, what the resistance against the emperor, Florence immediately armed as soon as he knew that Henry would come to them. Because the, the fall of Florence would have changed basically the whole Italian balance. Probably the Ghibellines would have taken over at that point. Everywhere. Um, Dante said about his own uh, fellow citizens, the most heinous ones, right, that opposed to imperial action. The same you know, wrote with very violent letters to um, the uh, Italian princes about the situation, right? And, but in 1313, as we've seen, Henry uh, had died without having achieved essentially anything in terms of, at least of permanent territorial acquisition, still, however, shifting dramatically the balance in favor of, of the Ghibellines at some levels, at least balancing the, the thing would always remain very well balanced because, it, you know, as always, when somebody became too powerful, you know, normally somebody defected and re-equilibrated the situation, so it's always the same. So endless wars without any concrete change, right? Um, and Dante 
in spite of the bitter disappointment, remained tenaciously firm in his convictions that exactly in those years he would ex systematically expose in another work known as the Demonarchia. Um, between 1313 and 1318, uh, he was in Verona. Among those, uh, in those times exactly where the ferocious wars between the De La Scala and Padua would have happened, at the court of Cangrande, where he also managed to reconnect with his wife and children. And from there, um, you know, eventually the wars would end, and so he would pass to Ravenna, actually under the protection, as we've seen, of Guido Bonabello da Polenta. And there, surrounded by a solid fame, because he was uh, already understood to be this, you know, this genius, uh, uh, you know, he, he could work uh, in a serene environment uh, to the last part of his poem. And, uh, in fact, he has uh, just terminated the paradise and he hopes at this point to be able to come back to Florence with that honor, um, with honor to Florence thanks to that uh, recognition of his valor of poet when Guido Novello sends him as ambassador to Venice but getting sick on the way back to Ravenna he died there in 1321 when he was buried with great funereal honors. Uh, as uh, the, his uh, fellow citizen chronicler Villani says, it, quote, in, in best of poet and of great philosopher. And that's already, Villani is the first author to provide a biography of Dante and to create, and, you know, if you want, part of this myth because of, of the greatness of this individual, there was the pride of Florence, etc. Dante would be eventually popularized all over Italy in the way we, we know historically just by Boccaccio later on that had public readings of the comedy comment that also Petra uh, Petrarca did a lot of this, um, but his fame was gradual. But indeed, uh, uh, among the in the environment where he wrote, he was appreciated immediately as the genius that he was, and uh, eventually the thing spread to influence, as we were saying, basically world, world Western literature in an ir uh, unrepeatable way. Fundamentally, and the situation in, in here in Italy was still mm, difficult because 1321 had seen the renewed papal offensive in Lombardy, so it wasn't such uh, like that. It would be interesting to, to think what Dante was thinking about in his very last um, uh, years of life because um, he had seen how things were going to the other side, mostly in, in favor of the of the papacy, rather, and a papacy that had substantially not changed more than, I mean, Boniface VIII had long died, but for, but let's say that that Ghibelline ideal, that imperial power, we'll see better in, in, in the series here, um, that he strove for wasn't quite there, so it was. Ju it would have been just a reconnection with Florence and the honor, etc. But it would have been a, still fundamentally a defeat, right? And there is much about this prophecy, this spiritual value of the comedy, etc., of the fact of it being finished and that Dante died shortly after. He didn't manage to come back to Florence. So it's, it's as if it had been the ultimate glory of the exile, the ultimate proof of his sacrifice. In, in inside and maybe for his glory it's, it's as if it had been better like this um, I would say consider that Dante had also he was as uh, he was a curious individual he he probably he had already written the inferno at some point and he said that he didn't want to 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 finish the work and it was his wife interestingly enough who instead pours, spurred him saying you know you have to go on this is, and that's why we have, also thanks to Dante's wife for having had the, the, the single most important work in medieval civilization to, to have been. And, and this makes you understand how, how complex it is to read a, a medieval mind and how much we have lost also in the process, how much we can't know, how much, how mythical the spirit is, right? Because... Dante dies exactly in the moment in which 
that uh, Italian historiography and together with that European uh, civilization uh, took off literally in terms of the sheer scale and quantity of published uh, or properly of documentary production. Dante died in this mind, died in, 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 in as the great medieval civilization died. In the moment in which the contraction was arriving, like it, the mid 14th century was closed and humanism began, it was a completely different mindset. It was a traumatic, critical moment, which Dante was the same living proof in his existence um, of, of, of complete transformation and catalysis of, of, of medieval civilization in a way that we lost. Right, Dante is the last great exponent. Why? Why did they choose this title? Because objectively, it is so. You know that we read the Middle Ages as this enormous, mostly something that goes between the 10th and the 13th century, uh, something enormous. We know by scale. We don't know precisely how big this thing was. We know that they they started building 80 cathedrals in a few centuries. That this thing over boomed demographically, over inflated started producing these geniuses, these things, eventually, mid-14th century, boom, black death, contraction, shrinking, whatever, the, uh, the world wouldn't recover, but in the modern age from that, so the last centuries of the Middle Ages, so what we see as humanism and Renaissance, surely not accomplishment of, a moder of modernity, but properly of, of the same medieval civilization that didn't die out like late, late antiquity after the crisis, but managed to adapt and to produce this thing, but it was elitistic, it was uh, courtly. Dante is already the proof of this, the fact that he, uh, he had to leave uh, as a humanist, that he's paid by, as a courtier, as you understand, as for working at this, because of the be beneficence, the munificence of these, um, these powerful lords that were rising, like popping up like mushrooms all over Italy, eventually taking over the whole system, largely. Um, and so... Dante is, is a hybrid, in a sense, maybe it's not good to define, because Dante would fit perfectly, mostly in the anachron in the universalism of, of, of the previous century, right? Dante would have been perfect in his own work if he had written in the 13th, instead he wrote in the 14th, and in this sense, his work resents of this... Um, artificial in the neutral sense of the term idea of what the world should be exactly in the moment in which the universal powers were collapsing right in the 20s and 30s and the 40s the empire shrinks the, the papacy shrinks there is a dramatic decline of universal powers Dante by just claiming that the church would have had to be purely uh, religious and spiritual was basically saying something that, you know, he didn't bring to the extreme. The Marsilio of Padua, uh, counselor of Ludwig of Bavaria, not surprisingly, that, you know, declared that basically the papacy was a complete imposture in, in, as long as it owned anything material, right? And that was like the single... It, it, nobody basically followed him, but the same fact that the Middle Ages could produce that idea it was basically proving the detachment, the complete detachment that also the events of John the Twenty Second and Louis of Bavaria prove that is the, for example, the unhinging of Germany from the Italic crown and for the sake of crowning. Uh, lots of things that for Dante were inconceivable because he still lived and he died just a couple of decades before, but he he still believed of the complete unity of 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 the system of Christendom, like it was normal in the previous century. So. Um, it's difficult for us to understand how even the generational process of this, as we were saying before, also the memory of the past, how m much did these people understand about the past um, or, or about the change that occurred in this in this time. And, it, and it's meaningful that some of the greatest geniuses and talents in the history of mankind have been produced by crisis, not by status, stasis, by florid moments. So that that's quite important to remember, to understand this work and to understand this author, that I hoped to at least to have uh, outlined a little bit better for those that have own kind of a general, um, you know, an, an average uh, idea of what was done, to what, what did he do, what was this whole thing about, right? The Dries, there is a lot to know, that there is that much to know, and this is just a very concise uh, story like that we, we can't properly even get this would 
Cavalcanti would be a guy that would try to throw a crossbow bolt <laughs> against Corso Donato because just because he, he met him among the streets, right? People who thought this and thought about philosophy and thought about art and literature and universal powers would know monarchs and uh, powerful rulers and whatever and, and wrote about the church and theology and the afterlife and leave this con continuous struggle. Do you understand how much they can say and tell us of meaningful to this day? Right? I don't even need to explain this, and we'll see it better in the next videos when we will properly look at what what Dante's work was about and how much it can tell to properly to uh, to us in a way that hardly any author was able to do at, re regarding to these specific topics. Right, and and this is the moment in which we can understand how in reality how truly connected we are still with the middle ages and in, in many more ways than we usually think right but for today we stop it here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time Bye.